is usually a bitter thing, especially when one tries hard to get back to an erotic dream which is not over. But this seldom succeeds. Everyone dreams, more or less, but few people trust themselves to relate or present their dreams as they are inhibited from making public their perverse thoughts. Now concerning my skin landscapes, these are my protest against the systematic poisoning of our environment. A sick landscape marks men, and my landscapes are nothing other than the transplanting of the human skin on our surroundings. these repulsive children's heads which frighten all women? What scares me most is overpopulation with all its horrifying side effects such as epidemics, mass hysteria, famine, and total environment destruction. For me, the greatest criminals against mankind are those who with the help of religion or false ethics forbid the pill, prevent abortions, and hinder old people from dying or This is Bijan Alam. He lives in Paris and owns several of my paintings. He himself can best explain why he likes and collects my work. Ja, mit ihnen leben und gern haben, das ist so eine Sache. Man hat, man kann dem schon seine Bilder gar nicht auf den ersten Blick gern haben. Ich habe es auch nicht im ersten Moment gern gehabt. Aber well, it's a strange thing to live with these pictures and, and like them. One can't be attracted to these images of Giger at first sight. But the first time I saw them, they corresponded to a certain truth. And I couldn't do anything but buy these pictures with all the means at my disposal in order to live with them. I remember very well how shocked my parents were when they saw these paintings on my walls. But these 
Pictures are not only a psychograph of the artist, they also have a secret hidden beauty to which I am sensitive. This is Sonia Koblet. She owns a very beautiful painting of mine. I bought this picture because even as a child I prefer surrealists and I have followed Giga's career for a long time. I am fascinated by his technique. This painting differs from his varied variations on penis and vagina. This picture shows a beautiful, engaging woman whose effect is very aesthetic, although she is surrounded by death and rather negative elements. This does not bother me at all. There are, of course, the reactions of my friends who look into my bedroom and say, how can you live with a picture like that? Well, first of all, I sleep under this picture. And secondly, this altercation between life and death creates no problem for me because in this painting, life stands in the foreground, and it is a very attractive life indeed. There, perhaps, I draw a parallel in all modesty to my own life, where the aesthetic is always in the foreground. We bought this picture because it fascinated us and not, as so many people claim, in order to provoke them. This picture expresses everything for me which a woman can feel for a child. Birth, contraception, overpopulation, infection and plague. In any case, we now have no problem finding topics of conversation with people who visit us. They come in and are horrified. In any event, one can do something against the abscesses and blood of the children in Mr. Giga's paintings. That was the Hugler family. I live here outside Zurich in a small row house which belongs to me. My studio is in it and I lead rather a secluded life with the exception of visitors, girlfriends and so on. I like to live alone. I work best that way. I do not like it at all when fans or other interested people come just to see how it looks where I live. myself. This went on till I did my military service, and there they spoiled it all for me and took all the pleasure out of shooting. Now, in my paintings, revolvers, pistols, and knives seem to demonstrate the aggressive character of my monsters.
Really, there's not the slightest doubt that Giger's paintings depict a morbid, exhausted, decayed world. But Giger, therefore, need not be decadent. That his pictures could turn out that way has more to do with the way our world is today. That was Roland Gretler, the photographer who photographs my work. This is Jörg Stummer of the gallery Stummer and Hupschmied, where I exposed my work in Zurich. In conversation with visitors to my gallery, I experienced time and again that people ask me what kind of a person Giger actually is. Is he raving or what is the matter with him? He should go to a psychiatrist. But this is naturally quite wrong because H.R. Giger is completely normal and paints his pictures with great engagement and unbelievable fantasy. At home, we have many paintings by many different artists. And when I ask Evely, who painted this picture? She said, see, that's by Giger. This is Sergius Golovin, writer and researcher of myths. Etwas ist auffallend, wenn man heute viel Gelegenheit hat, when one has many opportunities to visit country communes in which young people are trying to develop a new lifestyle, one is struck by how often Giger's posters are to be seen on the walls. These people don't even know who the posters buy. The only explanation is that these images express something which is in us all today, something archetypical and primal that we long for or are frightened of. I repeatedly think when I show these pictures to my mother and father, they will be frightened to death. It's odd that I always ask, in spite of my freedom, what do my parents think of me when I paint pictures like this? But as I am their child, it is actually quite natural. What I do must come from somewhere. This is a father who I don't have any understanding of what Kunst is, but I'm a Künstler, who I've brought here, I'm not. I'm in that sense. And why are you fantasy? That a father who has no idea what art is could produce such an artist. And where indeed does he get this fantasy? From the mother, of course. The mother has such a talent for fantasy and so nervous she sees ghosts and such things, or perhaps not yet. Of course, this fantasy is connected with an overdose of hormones at the time of nursing in infancy. When they started testing these products, it didn't come from mother's milk alone.
Sometimes, when I look at my paintings, I ask myself, what led me to such things? For example, these strapped-in children who have to play Indians. Children often have to play roles, probably because their parents wanted it that way. Duress of this kind in youth follows you into old age. I still remember very well how my mother packed me up in a kind of overall which closed with a lot of buttons or a zipper at the back. This caused difficulties when I had to go to the toilet. I despaired when I realized I could not shit and piss at the same time because the construction of my suit only allowed one of these activities at a time. So I had to squeeze both of them in and wait until evening when I was freed of my straitjacket. Among the elements which repeatedly appear in my paintings, it is above all the worms and the snakes which horrify me most. And I think to find a worm in excrement or vomit is the most horrifying thing I can imagine. In my pictures, worms take the form of technical elements such as tubes and hoses, and that reminds me of this. Once at Easter, I had to look after my grandmother's grave together with my mother. When turning over the earth, a thick worm crawled out and I thought, my God, that's part of my grandmother. I let the spade fall and ran out of the graveyard. My pictures exhibit a color scale of white, brown, gray. Actually, a very unhealthy, gloomy, pale world. An inner world in which the colors have rotting innards, sprouting potatoes, and decaying corpses. On the other hand, I love nature very much, the sun, the woods, and the mountains. when I realized how little freedom you have. Then I went over to interior architecture, to industrial design, but gave that up too, because you have to adopt yourself to human proportions. So I began to paint my architecture and inventions, and today I get it off on a two-dimensional surface.
collages in the galleries are a big occasion for the artist. At last, he has the opportunity to show his work. He hopes a lot of people will come and admire it. The people come, drink the wine, glance at the pictures now and again for politeness sake. People meet and want to be seen. For me, these events are always a little depressing. I pour out my entire inner life for them, vomit myself empty, and what do I get out of it? At the most, a look at a few beautiful women. That is the only thing which interests me on such occasions. That's why I prefer to exhibit with other artists, where everyone shows two or three pieces. Then you are not forced to admire your own work.
These were a few scenes from the science fiction horror movie Alien, produced by 20th Century Fox and filmed at the Shepperton Studios in England. Our documentary is going to show you some of my work behind the scenes. I was responsible for all the fantasy scenery in the movie and had to design the unknown planet, the wreck of the alien spaceship and its interior, and also the so-called egg silo and the different types of alien monsters. I made the first sketches and designs for the movie in my studio in Zurich after the first discussions of the project with the director, Ridley Scott. I flew to England several times where my paintings were appraised and we discussed possible alterations. These are a few variations of the alien figure I had in mind. They all emerged out of my personal visual world, which I call biomechanical. The egg silo, an unrealized project. landscape of the unknown planet. The alien spaceship, derelict. Details and structure of the derelict. Entrance of the derelict. Passage in the derelict. Cockpit with the remains of the unknown being who was her pilot. Pilot's seat and the pilot in detail. Shaft with a membrane. The interior of the egg silo. Model of the egg silo. At Bray Studios, a group of specialists are making the models we needed for the special effects scenes. My colleague, P. Voise, will explain in a moment how these models are made and finally used in the movie. of using plasticine is we can bed pieces of plastic pipe into the plasticine and it holds quite well areas like this we use pieces of plastic tube cut it fit it in fix it with polymer with nails or pins and then dress up to it with plasticine this has been painted at the moment somewhere so it'll be finished off later 
the more areas in here, we can cut into, into the polystyrene, we can cut through this part of the alien spacecraft is an area that was made full size on a large stage at Shepperton Studios. The total height is about 12, 13 meters high from here to here. You get some idea of the scale. That little figure there is approximately the right scale. The landscape was built at Shepperton Studios. Some of it, anyway, it comes back as far as here. A lot more will be built on the stage here in model form, which will cover a large area. Now we're inside Sherperton Studios, where movies like The Omen, Superman, and parts of Star Wars were filmed. Science fiction scenery is usually set up in huge studios called stages. Here, the models are built in their original size for the shooting of the scenes corresponding exactly to the previous design. The basic construction of the scenery begins with steel tubes and wood. Then the supports are covered with wire netting and finally with sacking soaked in plaster. To work out the final structure, we spread a mixture of dyed plaster and a gritty substance over the finished shapes with a mason's trowel. The more complex shapes are cut out of foam rubber and glued on. The general feeling here is really good and it's agreeable to work with these people. Tubes, only vaguely defined in the design, have to be integrated into the landscape and painted to fit in. Through the use of different smoke and water effects, the final decor achieves a really mystic atmosphere and is presented as follows. pilot in the cockpit. Using my design, P. Voise and I sculpt the pilot in his seat out of clay. Every detail is important because it has to show up well in the final mold. is the job for the plaster casting team who have to make a mold from this figure. They're really working with terrific energy. To stabilize the forms, they insert strips of plaster-soaked sacking. have to be carefully removed and all clay residue cleaned off to guarantee a perfect resin casting.
The remaining constructions are also built with wood, plaster and foam rubber. This man is carving out these technical looking trimmings with a lot of patience and skill. To create a homogeneous effect of the sculpture, I'm painting parts of it with a transparent sepia color. We have to use a crane attached to the ceiling to place the pilot, which was built separately, into the right position. The work has now progressed so far that it needs only a few cosmetic touch-ups to be ready for shooting time tomorrow. we used about 120 of them for this set, are the organic repositories of the aliens in their first form of appearance, the so-called face hugger. In the workshop, probably I had just started during a proverbial tea break. The pieces of ground on which all the eggs stand singly are in the making. The professionals are watching my work with interest. Probably the realization of a design like mine is new to them. The original idea for the eggs opening was a kind of mobile elastic slit, but the production felt that this was too directly reminiscent of female sex organs and worried about possible censoring in Catholic countries. So we settled on a similar but crosswise shape, which satisfied both the Catholic countries and my own sense of forms. Hugger. The design for the small alien monster named the face hugger is lying in wait inside the egg to be awakened out of its beauty sleep by the slightest touch of the astronaut's hand. It flings itself onto its victim, eating its way through the helmet and settles on the man's face forcing its long snout down into the helpless victim's throat in order to deposit its horrible seed. The cosmic incubation has begun. Having been a professional industrial designer, it means a lot to me to have a design show its symbolism as well as its functional aspect clearly. Therefore, 
I endowed the face hugger with the spring-like tail he uses to propel himself out of the egg, also with eight long-jointed fingers and two pulsing testicle-like appendages for the spores. The delicate mechanism of the fingers is moved by invisible strings and the pulsing comes from a small air pump. Interview with director Ridley Scott. When was the first time you saw Giger's work? Well, I'd never come across Giger's work at all. I'd been vaguely aware, once I'd seen it, of some artwork I'd seen earlier for a record sleeve, I think. Brain salad surgery, right? And it wasn't until I got to Los Angeles and I then knew I was going to be involved in the film. Uh, the thing about all these films, all monster films, or whatever you'd like to call it, is that uh, uh, the danger is how on earth are you going to finally do it? How are you going to make it, okay? And so that was one of the big concerns about how on earth it was going to be carried out. Who was going to actually design it, or create it? And I was shown the book, N uh, Necro... Necronomica, okay? Um, in Los Angeles, in fact, by O'Bannon, who brought it in. And I nearly fell off the desk, said, that's it, and uh, why look farther? And uh, so that's how I saw it. It was as simple as that. I've and never been so certain about anything in my life. <laughs> and what impressed you most about his work? Um, again, it's one of those things where I think it, the, there are a lot of, say, artists in this area and um, of... Surreali surreali surrealism or, or whatever you like to call it and I think Giga has an extra quality of uh, I think one of the most frightening things of all is a, a quality of reality um, combined with a sort of his own form of fantasy and I think that's what makes it stronger is the, is the reality not the fantasy yeah. and uh, was it easy to work with him? very very and uh, in fact, I'm hoping that uh, maybe we'll do another film very soon. <laughs> and has the alien turned out as uh, you imagined? Yeah, I mean, you always aim for the alien or the film. The alien. The, the monster. The monster. Um, uh, we shouldn't call him the monster. He's better than that. So I think that's the first answer, that uh, he's better than a monster. He's far more primal and far more frightening and far more realistic, in a sense, than the idea of the monster and so i think yes he's turned out very well okay. better than i thought thank you <laughs> my suggestions for the adult alien was generally approved by everyone the task of designing an elegant insectoid being that has nothing in common with the usual clumsy film monsters was solved. But we came to the conclusion that a creature without eyes, driven by instinct alone, would be far more frightening. That's why I painted a second version of the alien, which has no eyes. It's a lot easier to put down a fantasy in a painting than to translate such a creation into a costume that can be worn by a man. We realized this while constructing the alien's head. Now and then, our creation, it's a conglomeration of plasticine, technical parts, and a skull, is subjected to a very critical appraisal. We're constantly feeling the pressure of losing time. It has to be finished by such and such a deadline. And this often turns the problematic construction process into a nightmare. Finally, we've solved the technical problem. The rubber mold of the alien's head is lying ready for casting in the plaster shop. The mold is filled out with bits of fiberglass matting 
and then daubed with polyester soaked brushes according to form. The head, now it's finally dried, has to be peeled out very carefully to prevent the delicate elements from breaking off. Five of these heads were made. I got to work every day at 8.30, my studios in B stage. Two wooden partitions soon became an attraction for my co-workers' friends and families. I modeled the alien costume on a plaster statue of the seven-foot-tall Nigerian Bulagi. Its laborious, intricate work to fit on layer after layer of plasticine, to add in tubes, cables, vertebrae of snakes, and so on, in order to finally see the biomechanical alien from my imagination standing in front of me. Beside its toothed, flickering tongue, this creature also ought to have a tail it could use as a weapon. For this, I am using an animal vertebrae which appears to be flexible enough. These countless formal elements are needed to result in a really complete alien costume. In the monster manufacturing department, my co-workers are brushing layer after layer of fluid latex rubber into these molds day after day so that they can finally extract the fruits of their work.
aspects of the costume. For a perfect fit, a bit of artistic tailoring is called for. Now my job is to join together the different parts in terms of the structures and colors so that the audience won't see a costume but a convincing, realistic being. the studio, Carlo Di Marchi is working on the facial musculature of the monster. Because the creature is able to perform real movements, these have to correspond optically to the facial muscles. For this work, we're using contraceptives. his crew. Probably Ramboldi's most famous mechanization is King Kong in the new movie version. He was awarded an Oscar for the mechanization of that ape and he also instilled life into our alien. The facial movements are controlled by hand through wires attached to a lever console. At last, the long-awaited first appearance of the alien on scene. instructions to the stuntmen. 
the acrobatic parts of the scenes are mainly played by a stuntman. And now, complete silence. Everyone present is watching events with great suspense. After the scene is shot and complete, everything gets torn down rather brutally and thrown away. You really have to be a seasoned professional to stand this sight without feeling some nostalgia. The next producer is already waiting at the door with his contract. <laughs> 